Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Valentine's Church, Loveland, Ohio. So I would like to begin saying all of these things to you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So this morning we read three very interesting, very mysterious passages of Scripture. And there's a lot to be said about the book of Baruch which we started out with in our readings this morning in the Archdiocese. And the book of Baruch in the third chapter is one of the most important passages of Scripture that talks about holy wisdom, what we call the Agia Sophia, the wisdom of God. And with Proverbs chapter 8, we see that there's a balance point between the feminine attributes of God, which is the wisdom of God, and the word of God, the logos, okay, the mamre. And this is a very important balance that we see throughout the Old Testament. And we see in the New Testament, Jesus came as a man, and he instituted an all-male priesthood, and he left 12 apostles to minister in his name, and those apostles left other bishops and presbyters in their place so that they could minister to the church. But that does not exclude women. It does not exclude holy wisdom. It does not exclude the chokma or the Sophia of God. And so we have to understand that God does have a very beautiful and profound feminine side, that he is pictured in godliness and chastity and purity and, and primal and virginal self-control. And in this, we see a beautiful picture of the Holy Theotokos. In Holy Wisdom, that self-controlled woman, that one who does the will of God, and even the men cannot stand before her, before her beauty, before her love, before her grace, we see the same is true in the Most Holy Theotokos, who really does in so many ways typify that kind of beautiful, holy femininity. And so, while our church rejects the premise of secular feminism, we embrace the equality and beauty and love and importance of women. While we do not accept a female priesthood, which would break the icon of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, we do embrace the importance of women in our church and in a non-ordained capacity as a deaconess. We make a very clear distinction between those who have received the grace of the presbyteral and the Episcopal order and those who are serving other women and children as a deaconess. We don't believe that they're the same rank, that they uh, exist on the same plane, but they also exist with the power of the Holy Spirit to do the will of God and to work amazing miracles throughout the church through the prayers of righteous women and good teaching of faithful and biblical women, mothers, widows, um, old women in the church. And so as we look at Baruch, as we look at the description of holy wisdom, we see there a pattern of God's plan for a holy woman. And that's something that we must remember. We also look today at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 10. And 1 Corinthians 1 through 10 is something that I want to read again to you this morning because it encompasses what we call the simple Orthodox gospel. And that is the title of my sermon this morning, is the simple Orthodox gospel. People don't understand that the gospel is simple. A lot of times in these apostolic churches, they get distracted by various points of history, by the vestments, by the icons. If you notice, we took down the icons in preparation for our move to Los Angeles. But in this whole process, what we see is that these things, which are very important and very central to our faith, and in no way bad, sometimes they can become distractions. And especially with uncatechized young people, people who don't have parents who are very serious about their faith, it's very easy for people to get confused and make the external things that are important and that we in no way despise, they make those things the center of their faith. So they think orthodoxy is all about icons, or they think that um, the Catholic faith is all about um, you know, being a certain ethnicity or speaking a certain language, or having liturgy in a certain language. And these things are all very important, they're all very fine in their own place, but they are not the essence of the simple gospel. And so this morning we need to hear from St. Paul's own lips, what is the simple gospel? What is the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? What is the message that he was trying to give to these new Gentile believers, these new Hellenic believers in Jesus Christ, and what made them so special? What made them Christians in the face of both paganism and a very conservative, extremely critical, very um, antagonistic 
Hebrew Pharisaical faith. So what's the difference here? What's the simple difference? And let's read here. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last also he was seen of me, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So here the apostle Paul is laying out that which was given to him that he received, that he's turning over to the church. This is a process in Greek called paradosis, okay? And this word here, that's that which was received, the paradoxa, that is a very important central term to St. Paul. It's actually a word that in other places is translated as the evil T word. The T word is the word that the Protestants don't like very much. You know what that word is? Tradition. They hate that word. They hate the word tradition. But that is the word here, the paradosis, that he has received and that he's turning over to us. It's something that he received and it's something that he's given without adding anything to it or detracting anything from it. That is the responsibility of the church. The paradosis of the church is the tradition of the church. It encompasses the scripture, but the scripture is a part of the church. The scripture does not define the church. The church defines the scripture. And so this is very important for us to understand that this very important evil T word that Protestants don't like so much, tradition, is actually the essence of what St. Paul is saying here. That which he has received, he is delivering to us here in verse 3. And that tradition is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the tradition teaches us what to think about the Bible. It teaches us what the gospel is. So the, the tradition that St. Paul has received, which is the thing that he's gotten from the, all the other apostles and that he's heard from the very mouths of those 500 brethren that at that time were still alive, that saw Jesus Christ all at once after his resurrection, that tradition is what he's received and it tells us that Jesus Christ died according to the scripture. So he's not saying the scripture tells us, he's saying the tradition tells us that Jesus Christ did these things according to what is written, what is given to us by the testament, by the testimony of those who saw with their own eyes, who touched Jesus with their own hands. They saw and touched and felt and ate with Jesus Christ. And that was the hearty tradition. That was the unchangeable faith of the early church because they saw these things. They saw them with their own eyes. They knew that Jesus died. They saw him die. They saw him die on the cross. They saw the horrible things that the Romans did to him. And what happened? He rose again from the dead. That one fact is the key of all the gospel. That one claim is the foundation of everything that we believe. And later on in this very chapter, St. Paul says, if there is no resurrection, there is no hope. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then we are of all men most miserable. If there is no resurrection, then what are we believing in? But we know that there is a resurrection. They saw Jesus Christ with their own eyes. They felt him, they touched him, they ate with him again. And in that, they have the essence of the simple gospel. The very basis of what the early church believed is, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. That is why during the whole season of Pascha of Easter, we are so exultant, so joyful, so jubilant in the proclamation that Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. The reason we're so exulting in this is because this is the essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ did rise again from the dead. And he rose again by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And that makes Jesus Christ the Messiah. That makes him the ultimate one 
who triumphs over death, fear, and the grave, and he makes a way of salvation for us. So here he says, these things are known. They've been seen. They were seen by Cephas, St. Paul, then of the 12, then of the 500. They all saw them, and many of them remain to this day. The Apostle Paul knew these people who saw Jesus Christ, and he saw Jesus Christ again. He says he's the last to see Christ. When did he see Christ? We know that he started seeing Christ on the way to Damascus. He was on the road going to persecute the Christians. And what happened? Jesus showed himself on that road and he blinded St. Paul and St. Paul fell off of his horse. And for three days, he was in mourning because he had persecuted the true and living God. And then after that, there was one sent to him. He was converted, he was baptized. And then after that, he spent three years in the desert of Arabia where he communed with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. If I was here on earth or in heaven, I don't know. But I received all these teachings, all these preachings that I give to you from Jesus Christ himself. And so what we see is the early apostles, the 12, uh, under St. James, the cousin, the brother of our Lord, all of those apostles received St. Paul. They gave him the right hand, which means he received their ordination. And then after he had received their authority, their apostolic permission to preach, he went out as a missionary to the Gentiles and he preached this message. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And all of these others have seen it. And I am an apostle too, even though I was born as one out of time. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By Jesus Christ's own power, I have become an apostle. By Jesus Christ's own power, I am now what those other apostles are, and I am now bringing the gospel to the world. Wherefore, whether I were, I or they, so we preach, and so he believed. It doesn't matter if it was one of the apostles in Jerusalem, St. James, St. Peter, or if it was him. They all preach the same message. The message is the same. The gospel is the same. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He has power over death and the grave. Jesus Christ is one with God the Father. Jesus Christ is God himself. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. What takes away our sins? The power of Jesus Christ. What tells us that Jesus Christ's power is real? His resurrection from the dead. His resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and now he rules and reigns over all from heaven. He is the God-man, and in him we find resurrection, life, and forgiveness of sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of all them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Here again, this is the theology of the second Adam. We all fell in Adam, and now we're all raised again to life in newness through Christ. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. So Christ is the firstfruit. Christ is the one who has um, done the work first and foremost before all of us. And as Christ is now raised from the dead, resurrected, glorified, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, we will also become when Christ returns again. And this is the gospel that he's saying. Christ is risen. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And the hope now is that we will be as Christ is. We will be resurrected and glorified and sitting on the right hand of God the Father as well. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subjected unto him, and he shall put all things under him.
that God may be all in all. So what is the simple gospel? The simple gospel is that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. The simple gospel is that we have hope through his resurrection, that we can be as Christ is, that we will rise again, and that we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ eternally in heaven. When he returns, all things will be set right. When he returns, all things will be reconciled. When he returns, the hope is in a new heaven and a new earth, a perfect kingdom where humanity can receive all the blessings and beauty and glory that are truly in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. When everything is under his feet, when everything kneels before Jesus Christ and recognizes him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings and God of all gods, as he is glorified in the world that he created, and truly he is the center of all things and giving life to all, then things shall be as God intended when he first created, before the fall of Adam and through the restoration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the simple gospel. This is the gospel that we need to be preaching to all of our friends and family and relatives. We need to be preaching and teaching that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and that through this resurrection, we have power and new life. And if we enter in through baptism by the power of the Holy Spirit into his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his glorification, all the things that are true of Jesus Christ will someday be true of us as we are made holy and righteous and clean and good and truly pure of our sins so that we can love and do God's work as he intended. This is the gospel. This is the simple heart of orthodoxy. This is what we truly believe and what we preach to the world. And this is what St. Paul here, the least of all the apostles, as one born out of time, receiving from Jesus Christ himself through these wonderful, beautiful apostolic teachings, has made clear for the entire Gentile world that we can be reconciled through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've said these things now to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be. 